let's talk about Hodgkin's disease. So, you know, we have um, brentuximab, vedotin, uh, um, you know, a lot of lot of data out in the last few years about you know using it at earlier in the time course, perhaps as a as a salvage uh, therapy before transplant, maybe getting people to transplant. There's data now that shows that um, for the high risk patient population that it's very effective in the post transplant setting. Are you using where are you using it? And using it in both settings or so that, that's a question that is uh, there's actually a presentation at the ASCO there was yesterday about using it as a consolidation up front to reduce the number of cycles of ABD and reduce the need for radiation. So very briefly for our audience, it was approved based on a phase two data in relapse refractory Hodgkin lymphoma with a very high response rate, over 80%, and very impressive and durable responses in patients heavily pretreated. So then afterwards, the next step was obviously to look at other areas in a relapse setting. So post transplant the Atera trial was very impressive in doubling the PFS, basically. It's a maintenance brentuximab post transplant with some neuropathy, but uh, in high-risk patients, this is uh, very, very interesting and impressive. And then um, pre-transplant, we actually, and there's data for Memorial and other centers, and we actually are using it as a first salvage line of therapy. It's about one third of the patient that can go into CR as a single agent, so it's outpatient, it's easier and all that. And uh, it's less chemotherapy, although we say chemo, not chemotherapy, it is a chemotherapy agent. We don't want to remind our audience, we often forget this. But, um, <clears throat> So we use it and then we mobilize patient and go for the transplant. And moving into the frontline setting, there's data from the Italian and also the US looking at a single lesion activity in patient frontline where the activity is 85% and 50-60% CR rate, you know, elderly that can get chemotherapy and very impressive. And then the uh, um, next step was also to combine with ABVD. So AAVD versus ABVD it was just completed. This is the echelon one trial, if I remember well and then we are waiting for the result. And then as I mentioned, the next step also is to try to develop, based on Nevo and Brantoximab, develop new combination that would offer a non-chemotherapy, quote unquote, in patients who are not chemotherapy candidate. And I think that's across the board. The question is that, my impression is that it's maybe more interesting to use it as a combination in a high-risk patient rather than as a durable maintenance. Because you know, if you talk about early stage heart skin lymphoma, the standard is a combined therapy, or if you have a PET negative early on after a three cycle, you don't need radiation unless you're bulky, et cetera. But, um, <clears throat> you know, committing patient to an additional six cycle of brentuximab and maybe more toxicity, and versus if you have a PET negative after three ABVD, you don't need radiation, you do very well, and you can always be salvaged later. And so I think this is something as we need more inform more mature data to really say on, on how this is gonna be in early stage, but definitely in combination with ABVD um, in aggressive presentation. Yeah, I was, uh, I was um, interested that, that the, there was the pulmonary toxicity. I mean, I'm looking forward to the, the results of the large randomized trial I'm replacing bleomycin with with uh, brentuximab vedotin, um, but I was I was impressed that the that the toxicity was bleomycin. I would have thought it would have been you know a problem with the vinca that you needed to take the the vin blasting out. Although um, a colleague reminded me that there was actually some data with naked CD30 uh, in combination with a ABVD, and they had seen pulmonary toxicity with that. So perhaps it's the targeting of the CD30 rather than the delivery of the antibody drug conjugate. It's interesting because I don't think we have any clear explanation, but in the original data, they had to actually drop to stop the trial and stop the, um, the bleomycin, as you mentioned. But when you think of bleomycin, it's an antibiotic cytotoxic that does not get cleared because we don't have the enzyme to break it in the skin, that's why you get the mark, and then the markings, and or in the lungs. So it accumulates in the lungs and creates an inflammatory environment. So there might be more CD30 positive cells hanging around in the lungs once you're receiving bleomycin subclinically, and potentially you have more toxicity this way. That's what the way of thinking about it. What about, you know, for what, what about uh, combining it with um, checkpoint inhibitor or, or other immunotherapeutics? If there was the pulmonary, we see pneumonitis with um, with the checkpoint inhibitors. Do you think there's going to be a potential issue if combining um, a checkpoint inhibitor with brentuximab Um Well, I, I think um, conducting clinical trials in that regard will, will help answer that question. Um, you know, as always, we have to determine the safety and then see if it affects efficacy. But uh, there's clearly uh, room for improvement in Hodgkin's lymphoma and uh, peripheral T-cell lymphomas where brentuximab is utilized. So um, 
combination with checkpoint inhibitors makes sense. I, I think um, the landscape of, of immunotherapy for hemologic malignancies is such that each of these different types of therapy are likely to provide something slightly different. So if we're going to talk about checkpoint inhibitors, they're going to sort of release the inhibition of the native immune system and help the, the immune system of the patient overcome uh, the malignancy. If we talk about adoptive transfer of gene-modified T cells uh, or other uh, immune system cells like NK cells, um, that's likely to provide something above and beyond uh, possibly the, the sort of native immune system, but it has its own limitations in terms of uh, logistics and toxicities. And then if we talk about monoclonal antibodies, um, it's just a perfect way to target something that's uh, on the surface of a cell or deliver a chemotherapeutic agent uh, to the surface of the cell or to uh, turn on those immune system um, you know, mechanisms that, that we've been talking about. So Krishna, this is